Hello and welcome to the Analysis Mason podcast. My name is Tom Rebeck and I'm here with Ibrahim Kasaji from our IoT team. Today we are going to talk about Sigfox that's recently emerged from a bankruptcy procedure with a, a new owner. So first of all, Ibrahim, just talk us through what's happened. Yeah, so in January 2022, Sigfox filed for bankruptcy protection in France with the intention of finding a buyer. So Sigfox has raised over 300 million US dollars in funding uh, since launching kind of in the early 2010s. But it was rumoured to be in financial trouble for a number of years, uh, particularly since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, where its revenue has fallen dramatically. There was quite a bit of interest in taking over Sigfox. Uh, several Sigfox operators, uh, venture capitalists with a stake in Sigfox operators, and even some NoRaWAN players such as Temps, and even some NoRaWAN players such as Semtech were rumoured to be in the running. Then in, in mid-April, the Sigfox operator Unibiz was selected from one of nine bidders to be the new owner, paying around 25 million euros to acquire both Sigfox SA, which is the parent company that runs Sigfox and owns the technology, as well as Sigfox France SAS, which owns and operates the Sigfox network in France itself. Okay, good. Um, now, Unibiz is going to be a new name to many people listening. So, so who is Unibiz? Um, what do they do? So Unibis was founded in 2016 and it became the Sigfox operator in Singapore and Taiwan. It has received uh, 35 million US dollars in funding with several backers, including KDDI, NG Ventures, uh, and several venture capital and private equity firms. Like all Sigfox operators, it's responsible for selling Sigfox connectivity to end users. And it's had some success early on in that regard, winning a contract to connect 1 million bikes in Singapore. But what's interesting about Unibiz is it's taken quite a different approach to most Sigfox operators. So firstly, many Sigfox operators tend to focus geographically on where they have the exclusive Sigfox license. But Unibiz has also been active in Japan, where it has a close relationship with KDDI-owned Sorocom, and other APAC markets such as Australia. And it also stands out from other Sigfox operators in it provides hardware and software services as well as connectivity. So most Sigfox operators tend to focus on providing connectivity and it tends to be Sigfox only connectivity. But Unibiz has firstly been open with working with other technologies such as LoRaWAN and MBIoT or LTEM if the customer requires it. And it's also been involved in the development side of the hardware and software. So for example, it helped to design and create a retrofitted gas meter reader which used Sigfox connectivity, um, and this was for Sorocom's gas metering contract with Nichi Gas to monitor 850,000 gas meters in Japan. Yeah, so I think there's a few things there that are important to to, 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 to highlight with Unibiz. One, it's the operating business, obviously, in, in Singapore and Taiwan, but it's also got interest in other parts of, of Asia, so it's not just uh, constrained geographically. Um, the second, that it's involved in other parts of the value chain, so things like the, in developing in hardware, like you mentioned, the example in Japan. Um, and then third, this is probably the most important thing, is that Unibiz isn't solely focused on Sigfox as a connectivity technology, um, but it's also worked with what LoRa as well, and it's worked with Cellular. It's, it's got um, narrowband IoT customers, LTM customers, and so on. Those are all important, I think, for Unibiz, particularly looking going forward as it um, becomes the new owner of, of Sigfox. So let's think about that question. So, so what do we think Sigfox is going to do? Uh, what do we think Unibiz is going to do with Sigfox? Now, I think we know some of it. We know they've they've given some hints in the press release, and there are some areas that are on aren't so clear. So maybe we'll start with the things that, that they've already hinted at in that in that press release. Yeah, so so kind of what we do know from the press release, the so Unibis stated its intention to strive towards the convergence of LP1. Now it's quite a intriguing statement, but pretty vague. So we don't know exactly what that would look like. But it could mean some sort of partnership with Laura One operators, um, which tend to be their biggest competitors, but it, it could be uh, working alongside a Laura operator in the same country that a Sigfox operator works in uh, with some sort of partnership or joint deal. Or it could involve tie-in with other unlicensed LP1 technologies such as Telenz's UMB or Wyson. And, and as we mentioned already, Unibis has experience working with these other technologies, uh, including Laura. So there could be potential for some sort of collaboration there. Yeah, so whatever, it, we don't know what it means exactly, that, that intriguing phrase about convergence. But but it's good. It, it means that Sigfox isn't going to be quite so standalone. It's going to work more closely with those other technologies, just as Unibiz has done in the past, um, which, which I think is probably a positive for um, both for Sigfox and more generally for the for the IoT connectivity market. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, and th there are some kind of other hints in there. It referred to kind of new strategies and governance. And again, we don't know exactly how things will change, but it's fair to say there will be several changes to how Sigfox is currently run. So currently, Sigfox, uh, kind of Sigfox SA, kind of the central entity, is responsible for the Sigfox IP, for the hardware and infrastructure, uh, and is also involved in the operator ownership of networks as well. And uh, it, it, it's often been kind of modelled. Th there's been some confusion o over kind of Sigfox operating all of those aspects and kind of leading to quite a fragile ecosystem. Yeah, because it's had this sort of role, this this multi-role where it's developing the developing the network technology, the IP for that. It's developing involved in developing the hardware. Um, it's also run some of its own uh, networks, like it does it in, in, in France. So if you compare that to the the LoRa ecosystem, or even the standard traditional cellular ecosystem, where you have different players in each of each of those roles, um, with Sigfox, it's had the same company in all of those roles, which has um, le led to it being quite fragile. And obviously, we've seen with the, the bankruptcy. So it's probably reasonable to expect post bankruptcy those roles will be split out more. Um, and possibly more of a role for the different operating businesses, the different Sigfox operating companies. Yeah, so uh, in 2019, uh, 45 Sigfox operators um, set up um, an alliance called Ogun, um, and, and it's just involving Sigfox operators, and, and it was kind of separate from the Sigfox ownership at the time. Uh, and, and kind of the intention was to look after the interests of the Sigfox operators themselves. Um, and, and given that Unibis is a Sigfox operator as well, you'd expect that going forward, the Sigfox operators, uh, there'll be sort of more collaboration and they'll kind of have a greater say in the Sigfox strategy and kind of the revenue model and so on. They will expect to have kind of more of a say going forward. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, these are the the businesses that have been using um, Sigfox day in, day out. So they know they have a very clear idea of what they need from the, that, that, that central central part of, of, of Sigfox. Um, what do we think this means more more broadly? Um, thinking, uh, but both in terms of Sigfox as a technology, but also IoT connectivity generally, and that the, the market there. Yeah, so I think the biggest point for Sigfox operators will probably be a sense of relief that the period of uncertainty after the bankruptcy is over. You know, the the bankruptcy period, kind of January to April, it, it was handled pretty quickly and kind of without too much negative attention from the press, I'd say. Um, so they'd kind of welcome the end to the uncertainty and, and a chance to, you know, to define their strategy going forward. And as we said, the Sigfox operators had limited influence over Sigfox strategy in the past, and will probably expect to have a greater voice uh, and, and kind of more collaboration in how things are run going forward. In terms of IoT more generally, I guess it's less certain on how things will change, but the potential collaboration with other LP1 is a really interesting as aspect. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but if there is some sort of potential to kind of consolidate or standardize the un unlicensed LPWA solution, that would be an interesting proposition to go against mobile operators who are using an MBIoT and LTEM. So if Sigfox and Lore operators in a country can kind of team up and, and have a joint solution, um, or, or just to offer greater choice to customers to, to be able to offer one or both technologies, uh, you know, that might kind of lead to greater flexibility in the LPW1 space. Um, and, and it might have implications for the operators in terms of greater competition, but we could also see just kind of... Uh, a, a kind of multi-technology approach where the customer has, you know, different options for different use cases or different scenarios. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, the fact that it, the whole process happened relatively quickly, um, and and re, re, probably people on the entire side feel differently about it, um, perhaps. But at least from an external perspective, it seems like the the whole process, the whole bankruptcy process, um, which could have dragged out for a much longer time and been a lot messier, has gone through fairly quickly. Um, what is it, four or five months? Probably not even uh, from from start to finish. Um, so the fact that that's happened fairly quickly must be a good thing. Um, I think also that, as you say, there's not much negative press attention. It's not as if there have been articles in the Wall Street Journal, the FT, about what's happened with, with Sigfox. So that's re limited the amount of damage, um, which must be a good thing for, for, for Sigfox and the operating companies. Like you say, they must be very relieved that it's um, it, it's been resolved. Um, and they're probably also, I would have thought, quite comfortable with Unibiz as, a, as, the, as the new owner. Um, 
yeah, more generally, um, the idea of Sigfox working alongside these other technologies, uh, you mentioned possibly competing with, with mobile or cellular, but I, th I think there's probably potential for these all of these different technologies to work alongside each other. They all fit different use cases. Um, so that, that, that must be a good thing that they can work alongside uh, each other. And that, um, that seems to be one of Unibiz's aims. Um, and I think just more generally, the, the, uh, the prospect of uh, an IoT connectivity technology going, going bankrupt and, and ceasing to exist, that would have potentially been quite damaging for the IoT connectivity market. Yeah. Um, uh, for businesses looking at IoT services, that could have, been a, that could have caused them to, to, to have doubts about investing in any technology. Um, uh, for investors as well, that could have caused some risks. So the fact that it's emerged from this, that Sigfox has um, survived all all, I think, probably good things for the IoT connectivity market. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Ibrahim. Now, there's plenty more content on uh, Sigfox and other IoT connectivity providers on our, our website. We've written about these issues quite a lot in the past, so there's, there's, there's plenty there. If you'd like to automatically receive future episodes, please subscribe to the Analysis Mason podcast. We'd also welcome your feedback, your comments, and reviews. Thank you for listening.